everyone. I'd like to go ahead and uh, start our last lecture for the term and uh, talk about the final exam. So let me start there uh, so that we're all aware as to the timing for the exam. And you may have seen this announcement uh, that is in Canvas. And you can see that the exam will open on Monday, June 26th at 12 a.m. midnight. Uh, it will remain open uh, until 11.59 on Sunday, July 2nd. Um, 11, it's 11 and it'll close at 11.59 p.m. Um, like midterm one and two consists of 25 multiple choice questions uh, from uh, questions from chapter five, six, and 10. I'm not going to uh, cover chapter nine. Chapter nine uh, is dealing with fixed asset larceny, which is, I, I didn't see anything there that was materially different from what we've talked about uh, from Lars about larceny from other chapters. So uh, I'm not going to include that on the uh, final exam. So it'll just be the three chapters, five, six, and 10. Uh, it'll be 25 multiple choice questions that will be worth four points each, just like we've done in the other two exams for a total of 100 points. Uh, you have three hours to complete the exam. And again, um, the warning that I've given before, do not open the exam until you're ready to begin it. Once you open it, the clock starts running and um, you know your three hours will erode as you move along. So uh, I think three hours is plenty of time to work the 20 multiple choice questions. Again, do your own work. Uh, you can only use material from the class, the slides, the practice exams that I've given you. You've all done very well, uh, I think, by going through those practice exams and then seeing how they apply uh, to the questions that you get on your actual exams. You can use any of that material, but nothing from outside of the class. Okay, so with that, I think we are ready to jump into our last lecture. Okay, and uh, there's our practice exam, but I want to look at the slides for chapter 10. Okay, there they are. And uh, let's go ahead, let's take a look at these and I'll put this in slideshow mode uh, so we can get a better look on the screen at them. So uh, just taking a look at the chapter 10, we're talking about corruption. And when we start to talk about corruption, um, there are different forms of corruption, conflict of interest, bribery, illegal gratuities, economic extortion. And we'll go through some of the details under these as we move along. Um, as we've seen in previous slides, the occurrence of uh, the types of fraud and abuse that we're looking at Corruption, you know, about a third. And then you can see uh, down here, corruption accounting for about 250,000 on average of losses. And then um, <clears throat> the different types of corruption. And you can see bribery, conflict of interest, illegal gratuities, and extortion and the amounts that they involved. So taking a look at bribery. Bribery is offering anything of value. I think that we tend to think that, um, you know, it's got to be cash. Anything of value could be paid for travel, et cetera, that buys the influence of the recipients, uh, recipient. Uh, we have commercial bribery, uh, which is basically going on in a business environment, kickbacks, and then uh, bid rigging schemes where we're looking at different vendors that are going to be offering bids and we kind of uh, rig things towards a particular bidder because we're getting some sort of uh, incentive from the uh, bidders. So when we talk about kickback schemes, it involves the submission of invoices for goods and services that are either overpriced or don't exist. They're completely fictitious. It's going to involve collusion working together, okay, of employees and the vendor that presumably will be being paid and then some money is going to be kicked back, that's the term, to the employee that is involved in this scheme. Um, it almost always focuses on the purchasing function of the uh, victim company. Uh, 
so what happens is the vendor pays the kickback uh, to ensure a ready stream of business from the purchasing company. Um, and as a result, there's no incentive to really provide a quality merchandise or a competitive lower price and almost always leads to the company overpaying for goods or services. Um, now it involves employees with approval authority. And so the vendor submits inflated invoices to the victim company, overstates the cost or reflects fictitious sales. And then the person with the ability to authorize that purchase is the one that would receive the kickback and they authorize that. Um, now, if an employee lacks uh, approval authority, they may figure out a way to circumvent purchasing controls. And guys, I know you've heard this to a point of probably novice. Now, separation of duty is the best way to prevent these fraud schemes. So there really should be a separate purchasing agent and the separate purchase, purchasing agent, when I say separate, separate from the requisition process. So maybe I'm the head of the IT department and I need some laptops. Well, I really shouldn't be able to call the laptop computer vendor directly to secure those laptops. We should have a purchasing agent and that purchase, purchasing agent's entire job would be to get us the best price for those laptops, whatever it is, and they really would be evaluated on their ability to get us those good prices. And in the event that they're not doing that, they're not gonna be in that position long. But only that purchasing department, purchasing agent should have the authority to actually order the goods, purchase the goods. And then once there is that purchase order submitted, give that to the accounting department, the record keeping, so that they can go ahead and do the appropriate accounting for the payable and whatnot. The receiving department should get a separate copy of that purchase order. So then they receive the goods, they bring the goods in, they put a plate on those items so they're identified and whatnot. And then they're given to, given to the re, uh, request, the requisition, the requesting person, the, the head of the IT department, this example, that needed the laptops. And then of course, once the uh, receiving report is received by accounts payable, they get the invoice from the vendor. And at that point in time, they go ahead and put the payment packet together. And the treasurer is the one that would be able to release the payments at that point in time. By keeping no separation of duties, you would avoid this kind of kickback scheme. But if somehow an employee that didn't have um, a, a approval authority figured out how to get that approval authority um, and circumvent the kind of the controls that I'm talking about, then they would be able to prepare false vouchers to make it appear that the invoice is legitimate, forge an approval signature, have access to a restricted password or computerized system, and then uh, it would be difficult to detect since the victim companies attack from both the vendor and the employee that has somehow um, either taken advantage of weak controls or circumvented the controls. Again, um, separation of these functions, as you can see, would have avoided a lot of this, okay? Uh, other pick, kickback schemes, uh, discounts are given in exchange for bribes. So they will go ahead and say, hey, you know, here's some um, some some money, and we'll discount you if you want to come and buy some uh, computers and make sure and you know charge an inflated price or whatever uh, to the company. Uh, slush funds, uh, other side of the transactions fund can be paid from other accounts or paid as consulting fees, etc. Um, you know, again, to get money out of the company and into the uh, vendor's hands inappropriately. Detecting, uh, it's tough to detect, okay? Uh, so, uh, but you could do some tests where you're looking for price inflation, uh, outrageous price that's paid for something, maybe just uh, having a listing of market prices of things and periodically, maybe having the internal auditors look to see if there's some prices that look a little too costly. Uh, monitor trends and cost of goods sold, okay? Why is our inventory costing so much? Our gross profit 
gross margin is dropping, um, uh, or um, um, it often what will happen is they'll start with a small increase and they get away with that, they get away with that, and then it grows over time. So doing a longitudinal or horizontal analysis over time, seeing it grow. And of course, if we're in an inflationary period, uh, that might be the reason for that. But uh, taking a look at that and investigating things that seem out of whack uh, would be a way of detecting these kickbacks. Um, look for excessive quantities purchased while all of a sudden we have a spike and we're all of a sudden ordering all of this service or good that we haven't in the past. Investigating inventory shortages, meaning why do we have a difference between what we're saying that we received as inventory and our actual count of inventory? Well, maybe the goods aren't really being shipped uh, and it's just a fictitious invoice and whatnot because of this kickback scheme. Uh, look for inferior goods purchased, right? The uh, person that's getting the kickback really doesn't care the quality of the goods that we're receiving. And so we start to see a drop off in the quality. Uh, that would be potential indication of a kickback. And then comparing actual amounts to budgeted. Hey, we budgeted this much for our inventory for purchases, for our purchases of services. Why do we all of a sudden have this huge spike? Maybe there's some kickback going on. Preventing kickbacks, again, guys, separation of duties is the best way. So having an employee independent of the purchasing department routinely, routinely review buying patterns. Um, again, the internal auditors maybe could do this. If you have an internal audit department, if not, maybe the board of directors audit committee, some of them assume some of these responsibilities periodically. Um, you know, this serves two purposes, of course, reliability and our internal control can give us reliability in financial reporting, but also reliability in operations. Even if there isn't a kickback scheme going on, the question would be asked, well, why are we all of a sudden having this increase in prices and whatnot? Is our purchasing department really doing a diligent job in getting us the best price, regardless of any sort of kickback? Uh, make sure that the contracts have a right to audit clause so we can come back and look at those. Establish written policies prohibiting employees or, um, for uh, soliciting or accepting any gift or favor, anything. Okay, We should have zero tolerance for that. There really is no reason why our employees should be getting free samples and that sort of stuff from a supplier expressly forbid any employee from engaging in any transaction on behalf of the company in which they were um, have an undisclosed personal interest. Okay, so, uh, you know, they really shouldn't be negotiating with their brother's company for services and whatnot to the company, right? Implement an ethics policy that clearly explains what improper behavior is and provides grounds for termination for any bribe or kickback. So being very specific about that, right? Okay, bid rigging schemes. What happens here? Bids are to be submitted, though uh, for certain things over a certain dollar threshold. Uh, you know, you probably wouldn't go getting bids for, you know, computer paper or something like that. But for large ticket items, you might go ahead, or if you're having a, a large project, you might have different bidder, uh, different vendors, I should say, submit bids. Okay. And, and um, these bids need to be secured as they're submitted so that no other vendor knows, no other supplier knows what the other person is bidding. And then, of course, those bids need to be opened at the same time. And then the lowest bid would win uh, that particular uh, contract, whatever it is that we were trying to acquire. Okay. Uh, the more power a person has over the bidding process, the more influence they can exert over the selection of the winning bid. Potential targets of the fraud here would involve the people that are involved in buying, uh, responsible for contracting the company, engineers and technical representatives who are going to know the technical specs, details of things. They could arrange this so that maybe it is aimed at a particular vendor that they maybe are getting a kickback from. So we need to be careful with those folks. Uh, quality or produce uh, assurance uh, representatives would be another. Um, 
uh, target and subcontractor liaison employees uh, would also be a potential target. Okay. Uh, so what happens? Um, need recognition schemes uh, prior to the solicitation phase. So the employee of the purchasing company may just you know, create a need that really isn't there and then have the specifications tailored to the strengths of the particular supplier. Or maybe we really do have some need for something, but again, the specs are tailored so that they are going to, you know, ultimately go towards only one vendor that would be capable of providing that kind of service or that kind of uh, product or that kind of um, um, product that's being developed, whatever it is. Uh, trends indicating a need recognition scheme is occurring, higher requirements for stock of inventory levels, writing off large number of supplies items to scrap, so we have to buy new ones, defining a need that can only be met by a certain supplier. Again, uh, maybe it's a legitimate need of the company, but they write the specifications of this thing in such a way that only just this one supplier can provide the uh, work that needs to be done. Um, failure to develop a satisfactory list of backup suppliers so that these suppliers, you're going to start dealing with the sole supplier. And look, there are some things that you might have to have a sole supplier uh, because of maybe the sensitivity of the materials that are being created or some other specifications that are, you know, not a lot of companies can provide that can happen. But um, you should try to develop a satisfactory suppliers, um, a backup of suppliers so that you don't get locked into just dealing with the sole supplier. If you do have to have a sole supplier, and then you should really be uh, working very carefully with that supplier to make sure that they're helping you to construct the contract so you have some control over the cost. Uh, specification schemes include a list of elements, materials, and other relevant requirements. And they set those specifications to just that vendor's capabilities, uh, use pre-qualification procedures to eliminate a set of vendors. Again, sole source or non-competitive procurement justifications. This can happen. Um, this happens in the government, really, where we're dealing with maybe sensitive materials, we're dealing with defense contracts and whatnot. And so we really kind of deal with the particular a supplier and uh, that can happen, but there are other controls that you can put over that to make sure that they're not just taking advantage, just gouging the particular supplier. Um, there have been the stories of, you know, how come we have a, you know, $5,000 toilet? Uh, well, sometimes, you know, what they have found is it's necessary because we have, say, defense type items and whatnot. Um, you know, so it's going on a ship that has to meet very specific, you know, safety precautions and whatnot. But other times they found that they're just basically allocating all overhead costs to that particular project. And so we're paying for a lot of exorbitant things that we shouldn't have. So having an upfront agreement as to how overhead costs, for example, will be allocated particular project and whatnot. What would be an allowable overhead cost versus an unallowable? And I'm really starting to get more into government specifications, but for example, the federal government will not allow any alcohol, um, drug, you know, uh, type of entertainment type of things that are going into overhead uh, to then somehow be allocated to government projects. There's a prohibition of that kind of thing. And so uh, setting those up in advance in a contract where you have a sole source uh, provider would be a way of sort of, you know, uh, um, you know uh, uh, preventing this kind of a problem. Uh, delivery writing off vague specifications, um, requiring amendments at a later date, they don't put a lot of things in and then later, oh, yeah, you know, well, we really need to balance this before we can do that. Um, you know, so uh, specification should be very specific as to the detail. And that's where you would need your engineering folks to come in. But of course, your engineering folks need to be very independent and know that they aren't able to accept any kickbacks or bribes or favors of any value uh, coming their way. Uh, bid splitting. 
Uh, let's say we have, we say, well, look, you know, we're not going to nickel and dime things. So if a bid is under $5,000, we don't have to go through uh, as formal of a process. Well, let's say we need, you know, $50,000 worth of service. Well, what they could do is split those so that they're, you know, ten, five thousand dollars $5,000. None of them go over that threshold and so they circumvent the controls that we put in place for larger ticket items uh give a vendor a right to see the specifications before um the competitors uh get the specs so that they're out in front of their competitors and being able to research and get the information and they're able to put in the lowest bid all of these things um, you know would be things that uh you know would not be appropriate obviously um Again, the solicitation phase of bids, restricting the pool of vendors uh, by having a bid pooling, uh, where we're going to go ahead and just get a uh, set of bids that come in, then we're only going to look at those. Fictitious suppliers, restricting the time for submitting bids, soliciting bids in obscure publications. I mean, they're really... Uh, with the invent, you know, and the, the prowess of the internet now, they should probably be able to go and any bids that are open would be available on the company's website and the information as to how to put in those bids. Uh, publicizing bids, you know, for a short period over time, from holiday, you know, holiday season to the end of the year, we're doing this intentionally and then just telling, hey, here's your holiday present, you know, you might want to look because that's when we're going to have the bid. We're just going to have it open for a short period of time. Uh, submission phrase, um, phase, fraud, and seal bid process. And the way you may discover that is the last bid submitted is the last that is awarded because somehow, even though the bids were supposed to be sealed, um, they were getting access to what was in those bids. And then they finally tell that last person, okay, the low, the, the bid lower than what you're going to bid is, you know, $10,000. So bid 9,000 in that way you get the, you get the contract, right? Uh, so the winning bidder finds out what other companies are bidding. A winner, winning bidder may see the other competitors bids before submitting their bid and then get help on preparing uh, the bid. So there really should be a secure system, again, in the internet for uploading bids. Uh, back in the olden days, uh, when I was looking at the U.S. Forest Service, when I worked with the Government Accountability Office uh, for Forest Service, they literally had to submit paper bids and they would go into a locked box. And then that locked box would be opened uh, at the, at, you know, the specified date, one o'clock in the afternoon on June 27th, we're going to open the bids and those bids are open in open form and they're and the lowest bid is, is read out, the, all the bids are read out, the lowest bid is selected and that's when that person wins that uh, parcel of land that uh, will then be harvested for timber. Um, these days, something similar to that it's similar, but the same outcome could be achieved by having some sort of secure system and you only give certain individuals the right to, and, and you don't let that open kind of the way our, our exams work here. You, you know, you can't open the exam prior to the set time. So you can't even open those bids in the system electronically until the time when the bids are going to be read and everyone's going to see uh, what the winning bids are. Uh, detecting bid rigging schemes, look for unusual patterns, uh, a low bid, and then there's change orders. Oh, well, we have to do this now as anticipated. Or maybe you prevent that in the initial contract. Hey, no change orders. Once you have started this work, there's not going to be change orders. Uh, very large unexplained price differences amongst bidders. How is it that this person was able to come in so much lower than everybody else, uh, maybe they knew what the other bids were and they wanted to make sure that they got that. Uh, the contractors who bid last repeatedly receive the contract. So that same company keeps coming in with the lowest bid and uh, they come in last, right? 
uh, predictable rotation of bidders. Well, maybe, you know, okay, look, I'll get to you this time. Next time, keep everybody happy that way, right? Uh, uh, losing bidders who become uh, subcontractors. So maybe they intentionally made their bid a little higher so that, you know, um, they knew that this one person would win. And then the payoff is this one company would win. So then the payoff is, hey, you know, we'll give you some subcontracting work. Uh, vendors with same address and phone number. So we get a bunch of different bids to make it look like it's a legitimate process. Meanwhile, all the bids were being put in by the same. Uh, fewer bids than expected for the project. And then um, the project um, that has been split into smaller ones again, so that um, you know everybody's getting a piece of the pie and everyone's putting in a bid that's going to benefit them. Something of value, cash, promises of future employment, promises of ownership in the supplier firm, give you some stock, maybe a partner, gifts, liquor, meals, free travel. Um, I have found it surprising to hear recently that members of the Supreme Court have taken travel uh, accommodations from uh, companies and owners of companies that um, have cases coming before the Supreme Court. That should never happen. That really require, uh, really to me, requires some kind of uh, change in the requirements of the Supreme Court. That should not happen. Uh, cars and other merchandise uh, being provided, payment of credit card bills. You know, maybe they don't provide them the car, but maybe they give them use of some very nice cars, right? That, even that. A uh, payment of credit card bills, loans on very favorable terms, transfers of property, et cetera. All of these things obviously are of value. Illegal gratuity is given to reward a decision rather than influence it. Hey, Charlie, you know, I see that uh, we got this bid and we really appreciate your support. Uh, keep us in mind in the future. No, no gratuity, okay? Uh, economic extortion, okay? pay us this or we're not going to consider your bids anymore, right? And so the employee demands a payment in order to make a decision in the vendor's uh, favor, okay? So now the vendor may not want to be doing this, but then they're looking, they're reading the writing on the wall and saying, well, if I want to continue this, maybe I'll just go ahead and go along with this fool. So it's the employee now that is really extorting the vendor, um, for these favors, you know, these uh, gratuities and whatnot, um, because they feel that the person has so much power that they just have no way to avoid that. Um, taking a look, employee, manager, executive has an undisclosed economic or personal interest in the transaction that adversely affects the company. The victim organization is unaware of the employee's divided uh, loyalties and uh, distinguished from bribery in conflict of interest. The fraudster approves the invoice because of his own hidden interest in the vendor. Maybe they hold some stock in the company. Maybe they know there's a related, there's a relationship between them and people in the company. So they'll devise purchasing schemes, sales schemes, whatnot. Uh, so conflicts of interest can happen, okay, but they need to be disclosed. So maybe I work in an industry and I have some stock in a particular vendor in that industry. I have stock of companies that are in a related industry. Well, it doesn't mean that I can't work for this company because I have stock in a related industry or related or another company, uh, but I shouldn't be allowed to approve the purchase that's coming from that particular, I would have to recuse myself from that particular thing. Going back to the Supreme Court cases that I've been hearing about, not the Supreme Court case itself, but members of the Supreme Court, um, not only were they accepting travel and whatnot from people that had cases in front of the Supreme Court, then they would turn around and um, they would they wouldn't recuse themselves from cases where they had a conflict of interest. So again, you know, you think at the highest levels of law in the judicial system that that would happen, but 
unfortunately looks like it has. Uh, and it seems, I guess they're saying it's legal, but uh, boy, they should probably strengthen some ethical requirements. And we're going to take a look at some of the types of ethical requirements that would be appropriate to avoid some of these things. Uh, Overbilling schemes. Uh, bill originates from uh, the real company in which the fraudster has an undisclosed economic personal interest. Uh, the fraudster uses influence to ensure the victim company does business with a particular vendor, doesn't negotiate in good faith or try to get the best price. Uh, turnaround sales. So now I'm aware that my company needs to purchase laptops. So what do I do? I go and I get the deal on laptops from the vendor saying, sell them to me for $1,200. I know you like to sell them for $1,500. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to uh, get to from you for twelve. I'll sell them for uh, you know two thousand to my company, and then we'll split the gain on that or whatever. Okay, that would be turnaround sales, and uh, that obviously is a no no. Uh, underbilling goods are sold below fair value. Uh, to a customer in which the perpetrator has a hidden interest. Again, they're probably going to turn around and try to, uh, you know, sell that to the company or purchase or make from the victim company. And credit memos are issued later. In other words, they go ahead and they acquire the goods, but then um, what they'll do is they'll go ahead and credit the account so that no more money is owed. So now the, men, the person that the goods were shipped to doesn't have to pay for them at all. And they issue credit memos to write that off, debit the, um, debit the, um, debit the, the uh, sale, credit the accounts receivable. That's what we mean by crediting the account, credit the accounts receivable. Now they don't have to pay. We have the goods and we steal the goods at that point. Not we, but the people who are committing these fraud. Uh, business diversion, siphoning off clients of the victim company to the employee's own business. Uh, resource diversions, diverting funds and other resources for the development of the employee's own company. And then inadequate disclosures of related party transactions. Those need to be disclosed. Um, you know, these resource diversions, um, you know, this is this is a tough area because sometimes it sends them on leaving the company and I want uh, to keep these customers. So let me take all the, you know, all the information on the customer's contacts and whatnot, um, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, you can inform a client that you're leaving the company and then it's up to the client to decide hey if they want to follow you for your business or something but you shouldn't be in turn intentionally you know while you're still in control decision making at the company you know trying to divert business to a related company or somebody where you have a company where you have some sort of related party uh, transactions and um, you need to disclose those if you if you do and you would require that to be done and you could do that on an annual basis, uh, the disclosure. Um, you could do it on a project by project basis, uh, which would probably be wise to say, uh, as you enter into this project, you need to tell us you do not have any related party transactions with the vendors that are involved uh, in this particular project or the bidding of that project uh, so that it you know, if the person puts that down in writing, then it, and it may cause them to really think through what are the nature of their related parties, and therefore they would recuse themselves from that involvement in that particular project. Um, you know, you could do that on a you know biweekly basis each time they prepare their time card. They have to check off a box that says they are not in aware of any conflict of interest that they have as they exercise their day-to-day -day duties uh, as well. Um, so preventing, implement, communicate, and enforce ethics policy, sort of along the lines of what I was just talking about. Require employees to complete annual project by project, pay period to pay period. When they fill out their time card, make them check that they don't have any conflict of interest. Establish whistleblower 
anonymous reporting mechanisms, uh, compare vendor address and telephone numbers to employee address, telephone files and whatnot to see if there's some uh, kind of a match. Okay, good. That gets us through chapter 10. As I mentioned uh, at the beginning of our discussion here today, uh, we are not going to be having chapter um, 10 on the exam, so uh, on our final. So let's just go ahead and let's take a look at some example questions. Again, guys, you've been doing a great job looking at these practice midterm questions and then seeing how those uh, by uh, analogy apply to the actual exam questions. And so this is a good prep for us. So let's just go ahead and take a look. And number one, illegal gratuity is the offering, giving, receiving, or soliciting anything of value as a reward for a favorable decision. So really anything of value at all should not be accepted uh, in that sort of a situation. Um, which of the following is a type of kickback scheme? And what overbilling, right, is what we had talked about as a way as a kickback overbill. Hey, we'll give you a little bit of the money, right? Number three, to deter kickback schemes, an organization should implement which of the following separation of the purchasing authorization, custody, cash disbursement functions, like I sort of quickly outlined there in our discussion. Uh, B, track purchase levels by vendor. Why is this vendor all of a sudden always the winning bidder, always all business going to them? Prices are creeping up from this vendor. Right? Maybe there's some kickback scheme going on. Compare the prices paid for goods and service to market rates. Again, why are we paying so much more to this vendor? So all of those would be ways to deter uh, and potentially detect um, these um, kickback schemes. I guess it deters them that people know you're doing these things. And uh, you could detect these problems by doing these things. Number four, which of the following is a red flag indicating that an employee may be receiving kickbacks, the purchase of inferior to quality goods? They don't care about the quality. They just want the kickback. An unusually high volume of purchases from a particular vendor, the payment of purchase amounts that are frequently above market rates. Again, all of these would be uh, red flags that may help us detect that something's going on. Number five, to safeguard against kickback schemes, which the following procedures should an organization implement? C, prohibit employees from engaging in any transaction on behalf of the organization for which they have an undisclosed personal interest in the transaction. That is a policy that would be well articulated and then make employees confirm annually by project, by pay period, that they that such um, you know conflict of interest do not exist. Which of the following would not be a potential target for accepting bribes and bid rigging schemes? Bid rigging schemes, uh, product reassurance representative, yeah, contracting official, okay, the engineer in charge of the projects, technical specifications, account payable clerk, not so much. I mean the account payable clerk is going to see the invoice there and they're going to pay the invoice submit that probably to the treasurer's department for releasing the payment associated with that so they're not really going to be in position to you know fix the bidding process number seven which of the following is a red flag that might indicate that a bid rigging scheme is occurring the losing bidder becomes subcontractors okay uh, looking at some of these other, the contract price is unusually low. Um, okay, well, you know, what good is it really doing this vendor to be so low that now, you know, they're potentially not going to make a profit on it, right? The high bid is followed by amendments that reduce the payments to the contractor. Well, first of all, the highest bid is not the one that's going to win. So that takes B out just on that point. And D, many more bidders respond to the request for proposal than expected. That don't necessarily um, be any kind of um, problem. And, and maybe it's a, you know, means that we are getting a lot of 
um, interest in the project, we're getting more bids, so we're going to be able to have more, uh, you know, uh, prices that more chance that we'll get a better price on that and competition amongst the various vendors, various bidders. Uh, the primary approach for preventing conflict of interest schemes is to develop and implement which of the following, a voucher system, while well, the payment needs to be approved, a company ethics policy, yes, right? Having that policy and enforcing that policy strictly, right? A document retention program, an anonymous reporting mechanism to receive tips and complaints. Um, we mentioned that uh, as something, but um, the proper company ethics policy is the primary approach uh, for preventing that anonymous, re uh, anonymous reporting and mechanism scheme probably would fall more into the detection realm. Number nine, Stanley Block works in the IT department at Towery Inc. After finding out that the company is planning to purchase four more computers for the accounting department, Stanley bought four computers from a friend for $1,200. Then using his brother's name and address as vendor information, he resold the computers to Towery for $2,300. Yeah, that is a turnaround sale, like sort of like we mentioned in our discussion. Number 10, uh, Julia Smith is purchasing agent for Louisiana State Agency. He had a project budgeted for $24,000 that he would like to hire RGS consultants to handle. Unfortunately for Julius, uh, and RGS consultants, the state has a requirement that all projects over 10,000 must be sent out for competitive bids in order to avoid the bidding process. Julius breaks the project into three components worth 8,000 each. RGS consulting is subsequently awarded the contracts for all three projects. This is the bid splitting. Okay. Um, that is our discussion for chapter 10. Make sure you're noting when the final is going to be due. We should continue to do well on that. I think you've all done very well in this class. Um, I want to leave one final comment here. I think that, you know, these schemes are you know, nonsense, okay? If you're looking at any of these things and think that people that engage in these things are smart or slick, they are not, okay? They're going to get caught, okay? And you're in a position where you may be working, where you will be one that is charged with responsibility to identify uh, individuals that are engaged in these kind of things. Never think that these things are cute or funny or something that a person should um, even think about engaging in. Um, big, big mistake and uh, not a very wise move, indication of a really uh, low lack of integrity, obviously. But in my, my uh, opinion, it, it indicates a lack of intellectual capacities, okay? Okay, guys, uh, it's been a pleasure uh, putting these lectures together. Hopefully you learned some things and enjoyed some things and we'll see you when we see you. Okay, take care.